What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Manez. I'm joined by the busiest man on earth, Tim Legler. Legs, you hanging in there? Hanging, busy in a good way, man. This is uh, it's my time of year, right? And it's everybody's paying attention to the to the NBA right now. Excitement couldn't be higher, and I'm uh, I'm on pretty much everything NBA related that you could possibly view. I think I got a piece of. So let's go. I'm ready, man. Hyped. There you go. <laughs> I'm ready as well, man. This is when it all starts. Tonight, we have do or yeah. die games uh, for the Western Conference. We're going to preview both of those, the Warriors and the Kings, as well as the Lakers and the Pelicans. But we're also going to preview some of the regular playoff games, including the Mavs and the Clippers and the Cavs and the Mag uh, Magic, the 2-4-5 matchup. So we have a lot to preview today. Let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. First, we are presented, as always, by DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, stay tuned because later in the show, you're going to hear more about DraftKings and all that it has to offer. DraftKings, the crown is yours. I want to start, though, with some breaking news that came across the desk this morning. And it's not really breaking news to me. I assume this when you yeah. saw the non-contact injury with Giannis. But it became official today that the Bucks are planning to go into their series without Giannis. And they hope he returns at some point during the series but will not be available at the beginning of it. Legs, the margins on this one were already so close. This is a matchup where the Pacers have had success in the regular season. So already this was one that you looked at and said this is going to be a good series. But if you take Giannis out, especially for the first game, which is a home game, I feel like this affects the series quite a bit. How much do you think, in your opinion, just the early news of this, how much do you think it affects the outcome? Massive. But, but I will say this. I was on the break here. I've been debating, man, and I haven't been forced to make the pick yet because they're not scheduled to play till the weekend. I've been really considering picking the Pacers to win the series if Giannis came back fully healthy. Like I, I, I there's a two game difference between these two teams in the regular season, despite the fact yeah. that they have Giannis Antetokounmpo and Damian Lillard. That says a lot, and. I think when I look at just the way they played against them, that, we made a big deal about that at the time, as we should have. The way the Pacers were playing against the Bucs, it was like this crazy thing. The numbers they were putting up against them, it looked like the Bucs just had absolutely no answer to guard them in, in that stretch of games where they beat them three times in a row, um, beat them in the in-season in -season tournament. A lot of hype over that. So it, I think it is a tough matchup for them, stylistically, because the Bucs, have a little bit of a slower-footed defensive team with bigs on the court. Indiana exploits that. So the style is, is is hard for them to get back and deal with that early rush up the court, deal with the way that they spread you out and all of the dribble drives that they have and, and can attack you. Already was hard. Now you take Giannis, and this is, listen, this is a vague term, the start of the series. I'm not sure what that I means. Know. Does that I mean – Does that mean, you know – Hell, hell, he could come running out of the tunnel two minutes in, right? Technically, right? <laughs> Pull a Willis Reed on us and come running out. Like, I, I don't know. What I don't think means. it means that. And right. It doesn't mean that. But I mean, it's clearly okay. A game, two, right. three. Right. Like, what? At first of all, I'm not surprised by it either, Adam. Like, I was like, the way he went down in that game when he grabbed the back of his leg, and it's a calf strain, doesn't sound like a big deal to people. It's a big deal to a basketball player. And I just was like, how is this going to get right in time? So it's not clearly. And he's going to miss the beginning. Maybe that's maybe that's a game two. Maybe that's three games, whatever it may be. If it's two, well, that's two home games right off the bat that he's going to miss. Um, and without him, I think, to me, it's an easy pick in my mind to, to say the Pacers are going to win this series. If he misses two or more games, if he misses one, okay, even if they lose that game, he comes back game two. They win the game. It's one one. They can win a road game in Indiana. And clearly, they have Giannis Antetokounmpo on their team. They could still win the series. 
and it's not going to be a shocker if Milwaukee wins the series to anybody. If he's if he plays the majority of it, if he misses two games or more, I don't think they overcome this. I think the Pacers beat them. Yeah. How much of a morale, you know, sort of like uh, anchor is this? Because I have to imagine that's part of it. So you go through, this was not an enjoyable series, uh, season for the Milwaukee Bucks. It did not seem no. from the outside like it was enjoyable. And then right, like a ship inside of land, you, you get this news that he's going to be out now for the start of the series. So do you feel like this is one of those things where the Bucks have to know in the back of their mind it has to be deflating and has to take something out of even what they should be capable of doing without him. They might perform a little bit less just knowing that, you know, that being deflated like that. Definitely. And there's a lot, no, listen, there's something you, you carry with you as a team. When you know mentally, when you run onto that floor, yep. you've got a guy on your team that more often than not is going to be the best player on the court. Okay, that just gives you an innate confidence, despite how your team is playing, by the way, at the time. When you go through rough stretches or you're not playing well, maybe going into a series or or you're in a series and you're in a tight spot, you're down 2-1, you're down 3-2. Like You have – there's a confidence level you get from the fact that that guy can do things nobody else on your team can replicate and probably nobody else on the other team can replicate. And it gives you – and he's capable on a night to be almost superhuman in what he's able to get himself to do to help your team win in every aspect of the game. So that's that's what you carry with you as a team, despite the fact that I think we all can agree it's been a disappointing season. You still have Giannis Antetokounmpo on your team. So now if you talk about knowing going in, and they might know more than we do, Adam, for all we know, this might be the whole first I know. round. I know. Okay, yeah. and they might already know that internally because they they know what's going on behind the curtain we don't we're going to get these reports that's going to trickle out a little only going to give you a need to know basis just enough to be honest about what's immediately in front of them so clearly he won't be ready this weekend and early part of next week so they got to admit that now because everybody's asking them every day they're going to give you just enough every day that you need to know without lying to your face they might know a lot more already so there's no doubt that's a deflating feeling on top of it Look, Lillard's been had some really good games when Giannis hasn't played this year. So maybe the, you know they think, hey, hey, maybe Dame could dial this thing up to Portland Dame, and we can ride that. I don't know, man. I, he hasn't looked the same this year to me. And there's a lot going on his personal life and just the fact that he's in Milwaukee, not Miami. I think it's probably still weighing on him. Um, he he's he's not in a great place mentally, or maybe you'd have more hope that he can carry them through this. You add it all up with him not being the top of his game and Giannis being at, 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 at best limited, worst case, you don't see him at all. This is incredibly deflating for that team because I don't think they've got guys on their roster that can just go, you know, ramp it up a little bit. Give me a little bit more Bobby Portis. Give me right, more right. Pat Connaughton, right? Give me more Chris Middleton. I don't think that, I don't think they have that Brooke Lopez. They don't have that kind of roster. Now right. they have a Damian Lillard. Now he's, look, he, he I assume he'll he's still ramp it up. He can have a 40-point game. Yeah, he can go for 40 in game one and carry you through. I'm sure that talent is still there. But the rest of the roster, where are you squeezing that extra out of without Giannis? So this is a this is a huge, huge deal as we start this series. And, and I think in the end it was already confident. Now they actually they actually see some chum in the water, man. They think this is some team that's ripe for, ripe for the taking as opposed to just being confident that we've played well against them. Right. I, I I absolutely agree with you. This one, this series, the Bucks season has felt cursed from the start, and this series now obviously uh, takes on a different tenor. And I'll say, I'm with you in this one thing, one way. I don't think he's playing in the series. The way this is phrased, the way the injury has been covered and reported, and the way the Bucks have released information, it's always felt to me like they've known there's maybe a tiny chance he comes back in a game six or something like that. So they have to keep the door open, but it just doesn't seem to me like this is a one game absence, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I feel terrible for the bucks and, and yeah. how off course their season has gone. Um, let's get into uh, these other games though, that we know what's going to happen. And that is tonight. You got the Pelicans hosting the Lakers. They just played each other uh, two days ago and the Lakers dominated. Now, Anthony Davis pops up on the injury report with back spasms. He's been dealing with that, but pops up on the injury report as questionable. LeBron James is listed as probable, but it's at least noted that he is on the injury report. 
So what is your key to this game? We've previewed it a little bit, but when you look at this one, what do the Pelicans have to do to win this one uh, on their home court? Man, I tell you what, I went back and watched that entire game uh, that they played over the weekend. And look, the Orleans was in that. They, like, they were in it mentally at the start. Like, they, they came to win that game. And you can even see the crowd, like the way the crowd was, was at the beginning of that game. And I'm going, okay, let's see exactly how they did this. First of all, that's one of the best offensive games I've seen the Lakers play all year. Their pace was unbelievable in the game. Their, yeah. their initial surge up the court, which I think sometimes isn't great, was incredible in that game. Their defense triggered a lot of that. They were able to come up with some loose balls, turnovers, deflections. Uh, New Orleans get one shot at a time in the first half. You know, they were cleaning up everything on the glass, so everything was a quick outlet and go. And then they got down the other end, and they were absolutely just destroying this team in the paint. Yeah. And it, a lot of it was LeBron, a lot of it was AD, but it wasn't all that. Austin Reeves had straight-line dribble drives. Hatch Jamura had some. But it was mainly LeBron forcing the tempo, getting into the paint, creating opportunities where you had to rotate to him, and then Anthony Davis coming in and cleaning up everything. And they just looked overwhelming physically to the Pelicans. That's what it looked like to me. Too big, yeah. too strong, too dominant in terms of skill and size out of their two best players. Um, they do a really good, they've done a really good job on Zion and way that they play him. I think that the length gives him some issues. Um, he just has for whatever reason, man, he has not un been able to unlock it. He didn't again this weekend. And I just saw a dominant performance. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to automatically translate. They got to go into right. New Orleans again. This game is in New Orleans. So they have Hard a to home do. game here. Right. And the question is going to be, I think how, like how locked in and motivated are the East teams to win this game and get Denver, right? Because right? that's a big part of this. Now, I think personally they should be just all in, play, let the chips fall where they may. You get the Nuggets, you get the Nuggets. If you lose, okay, but we tried to win. That's a good place to be because now you go win one more game at home, either of these teams, against probably the Warriors, I think, and you win that game and boom, you get the Thunder and you got a legitimate shot to win that series. So – they're, they're, you know, but but the thing is, you got to go all in. I think and try to win it to, for the positive culture. It's, it's a competitive environment <laughs> of your team. It's important to do it. But yeah. I just saw I saw a mismatch when they yeah. played on Sunday. I saw a mismatch in that game. The Lakers yeah. overwhelmed them. They had sixty eight points in the paint, and it, it should have been eighty because they missed yeah. some easy shots. So I don't know how New Orleans adjusts to that, Adam. I don't know what you do. Valanciunas can't play, and and he couldn't play. You were going with a smaller lineup the whole time. You had Nance on the floor a lot, and they just look small, and they get thrown around, and that's what the Lakers took advantage of. They played to their strengths, and when they do that, the Lakers are really difficult to beat. I think the this matchup is just tough for the Pelicans, and the reason is they have to live in the paint. This is where they're best at, and Zion in particular is 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 best at it. Anthony Davis is a great rim protector against this specific team. So now you're saying, okay, you're going to have to win the battle of strength versus strength, getting to the paint versus protecting the paint. And Anthony Davis has had a leg up on that specific matchup against Zion. And then you look at the other notes and you say, all right, you've got to make threes then. You're going to have to win. Everybody knows that the Lakers, if you're going to beat them, you have to win the three-point battle. They made 15 threes, the Pelicans did in this last game. They shot 40%, over 40% in that game. So expecting them to do better than that, more than 15 made threes, more than 40%, that's not likely to happen. You don't count on that. That's above average to begin with. So I look at this and I think there is something to the, the strength versus strength battle here that favors the Lakers if they're healthy. But legs, back spasms with Anthony Davis – one, if I think the key to the the Pelicans winning, since I think that that is the dynamic that this matchup takes on, the key is get Anthony Davis in foul trouble. You have to be relentless. I wouldn't be surprised if the Pelicans have to fall behind early in this game at the expense of, yes, but we have to attack, we have to attack, and we have to put pressure on AD to either foul out or test his back. If he really does have back spasms and back tightness, make him work as hard as possible. So for me, that's what I see as the key. They've got to get to Anthony Davis and find a solve there so he can affect the game the way he did on Sunday. That's a great call on your part. And I think we're going to know early. One thing I've noticed about Anthony Davis here in the last few years, it's it's typically a good indication in the first six, eight minutes how this is about to go. He, he You rarely see Anthony Davis come out and sort of tiptoe around and and have one of those nights that, where he doesn't seem super aggressive, 
He's not putting his stamp all over the game on both ends. And then, and then th- that apparently was just a warm up period because here it comes. That's not really Anthony Davis. You can tell in the beginning of the game. So true. is he extend? Is he extending himself? to go get a ball at the rim defensively, like when a guard turns a corner, he's got to cover some ground to get there, and he goes and gets it. Does he get the first three def- defensive rebounds of the game for the Lakers? When you see those kinds of things happen, guess what? I got news for you. Buckle up, whoever they're playing, because Anthony Davis is going to be a problem tonight. He's going to be a problem all night. And But when he starts off slowly, or if his back's bothering him, or he's not an aggressive mindset, that's kind of how his night's going to go. You kind of feel that way. So I think the first six, eight minutes, man, is going to be a good indicator for how this game would go. And if he is in the mindset of of he feels good and he feels dominant and he's spry early in the game, I don't see the Pelicans winning the game. Yeah. Who's the X factor tonight? Who's a who's a non-star player that you think could really affect this game and swing it one direction or the other? Oh, my goodness. Well, putting you on the spot think- with that one. Yeah, well, you go first, and we'll we'll take turns. You pick, you, you take one team, I'll take the other, because I think we're probably going to say a lot of the same people. So don't, rather than be redundant, who do you like on the Lakers to be that guy? Well, I was thinking Pelicans. My guy Trey Murphy is the guy that I would think of with the Pelicans. I just think it's always like you need scoring, and he's the guy that can give you abnormal scoring. He's the guy that can have a twenty-four point night for you, and that tilts things your odds. And then the second point is three-point shooting is going to be such a huge key here. Like you've got to outshoot the Lakers from behind the arc. And he's a guy that can hit a couple early and really change the rotations and the way teams are playing. So for me, I would be looking to try to get him going in that first quarter just because I think it has a trickle-down effect the rest of the game. That would be my Pelican side. No, I like that one. I think for I would have probably said the same person. For me, for the Lakers, it usually is D'Angelo Russell. Um, and I yeah. just think when he gives them – when he gives them that – that confident three-point shooting and that like supplemental offense, really hard to account for everything you have to do against LeBron and AD, and then you're also dealing with that. And look, he's had a really good year for them. Um, and you know, he comes in and, and you know he's not shooting the ball like like lights out over these last few games, but he's such a wild card in the nights that he can go off. He can have like a 10 or point, 10 point quarter, a 12 point quarter yeah. at a time when you already have your hands full dealing with these other guys. That's really hard to overcome if you get that out of him. So, you, you know, you, we look for rotational players, and I know he's probably a little bit more than that. I mean, the guy's played in an all star game in this league. He's, he's a guy that is capable of going off, but I still would consider him a role player on this team. It's just that some nights that role involves him get, getting 20 25. And if yeah. he does that, I don't. I just don't know how you beat them because what you're hoping is him, Austin Reeves, Hachimura, any of their role players. None of those guys like get it going or have any kind of rhythm from the three. You've got a chance against the Lakers if they're also making. And they're never going to shoot a ton. If if they do, they're absolutely playing into your hands. They're helping you defensively. That's yeah. not. They're not going to have a high volume number in the three point column. But they have nights where they shoot a really good percentage because the shots they're getting are good, and those guys are stepping into them and knocking them down. D'Angelo Russell at the head of the list, if he's making those shots when you go and load up on LeBron or AD and commit that extra defender, very difficult to deal with the Lakers. They combined for 39 on Sunday, uh, Reeves and Russell did, which is a good bellwether for them. Of course, it was all LeBron setting the table. He had 17 assists. It was a lot of nobody being able to guard him and him just getting the ball where it needed to go once the defense collapsed. I think it'll be similar in this game because I don't think the Pelicans have a good – as much as they have great defenders, I don't think they have a LeBron defender. But it gives me one other X factor here, and that's Dyson Daniels. He only played 18 minutes. I actually think he is their best – like smaller defender. You have Herb Jones who's their best overall defender, but Dyson Daniels is a hell of an on-ball guard defender. And he only played 18 minutes. He was in the positive last game. I'd be curious to see if he plays a little bit more in this one. Uh, Just because, again, you're going to need to get some stops against that Lakers team who ran all over you the last time you saw him. You're right. I will say this. I agree with you about Dyson Daniels, by the way. But there there was a couple instances in that first half where, where he got caught in a cross match with LeBron early up the floor. And LeBron just turned and put his back on him and just took took him into the block. And it, the look on Dyson Daniels' face was, I'd rather be anywhere but here right now. <laughs> How do you deal with this? And I mean, like LeBron just ended up at the rim and shot like an easy, you know, easy uncontested layup. And just the look on his face was just like, man, that's a yeah. lot to deal with. Uh, but I agree with you overall. He's got good length. He's got good defensive instincts. I think yeah, he could be um, effective in the game. 
I look at it like this. If both teams come out and both teams play well, both teams are – their intent is absolutely to win the game at all costs, and they both play well, I think the Lakers' ceiling's higher on, on those nights when AD and LeBron are both playing well. I, that's, I just think that combination, because of way, the way AD will control the paint defensively on the defensive glass – limiting them to one shot, and then affecting Zion in that way, I think that's too much for New Orleans to overcome. All right. I got one more angle on this, and then I'm going to ask you who your pick is, and that is it was a blowout. And to your point, the the are the Lakers were in control of that game when they played on Sunday. But, and you're going to hate this, but the Pels were coming off of a four-game road trip. It was their third game in four nights. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that they have an excuse to have lost on Sunday. All I'm saying is... <laughs> <laughs> they should be better tonight. I, I I always hear from players that the hardest game to play is the first game home after a long road trip. It's always the toughest one. That's the situation they were in. So you get a night at home, you get a little bit more rest. I just think that if you watch Sunday's game and went solely off that, you'd say Lakers are winning this thing by 15 points. They're just too good. All the, all the things you just laid out were absolutely true. But there is hope if you're a Pelicans fan that tonight they don't look as feeble defensively as they did against LeBron James. Well, I'll, all the thing I'll tell you is this, having done it for a long time and, and particularly, you know, being on the East Coast for a number of years on teams and having to make those, I think, three long West Coast trips a year we had to make. I, I would disagree with, with the mindset like that that tough one is that first one at home after a long road trip. The, the tough one is the last game yeah. on that road trip when your mind starts to wander about going home. Because you've been gone, you know, in our case, Washington, we were always out there for like 10-day stretches. It's a long time time man to be away from home and you and then when you get home typically you have a couple days off after that then that first home game i just always felt an incredible adrenaline rush really of, All right. yeah, yeah i did i i mean I, look, every guys might have different views on it i'm just giving yeah. you my personal perspective i i felt so alive getting a couple days at home you know getting caught up on some of your personal affairs and your family and then you wake up the day of that game, you go to shoot around. When you walked into the arena that night after you've been gone out of that building for a couple of weeks and you walk back in there, I always looked at it like I, you just felt so energized going into the building. Um, look, I don't, you know, okay, so let's get, get, cut to it. Who do you like in the game? I like the Lakers. I, unless there's something weird takes place, man, where the back spasm is a real thing. And affects him. Uh, yeah, LeBron has a migraine. Uh, Austin Reeves ate some bad gumbo, and has a stomachache. <laughs> like I, you yeah. know, I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm not trying to yeah. be a conspiracy theorist. I'm just, you know, with all this stuff well. going on here. I'm just saying, <laughs> assuming Anthony Davis yeah. looks right and looks the way I described him in the first eight minutes of the game is a presence. You are noticing Anthony Davis every trip. I like the Lakers. I, I think yeah. I've pretty much laid out that case. If he's limited in any way, I think the Pelicans have a real chance to win the game. I agree. I agree. I think it all comes down to Anthony Davis's health and the Lakers' motivation, which I expect both those to be high, so I'll agree with you and say Lakers. But I will say, I think the best analysis comes from Chung here in the chat. He says, Pelicans win this game because they are an odd team. This is how I feel about the Pelicans' legs. Every time I pick them to be great, they end up looking terrible. Every time I say, okay, they're done, they're just they're too immature, they go on a hot run. So tonight I'm taking the Lakers, which I think is probably bodes well if you're a Pelicans fan. Let's take a break. We got a lot more games to get to, including the do or die game that takes place tonight, the Warriors and the Sacramento Kings. We're gonna break down that next and later in the show, Mavs Clippers and Cavs and Magic. We'll get to all that and more on the other side. But first. Let me tell you guys, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Did you know one man every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst men aged 15 to 35. With April being National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, our friends over at Manscaped have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. Visit manscaped.com slash TCS to learn how to check yourself for early signs of cancer. And as always, you can use the promo code all NBA. That's a L L M B a for 20% off and free shipping at manscape.com. Also want to tell you about our presenting sponsor, which is of course, 
DraftKings. The show is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the Sportsbook app and use code ALLNBA. The 82-game uh, preseason is in the books, and it's finally time for the real season. Later in the week, Legs and I are going to be giving you a betting guide to the playoffs, so stay tuned for that. But you don't want to miss out on the action, the playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament starting tonight through the finals, DraftKings has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. They'll have some odds boosts tonight on this Warriors game, the do-or-die game, so you can take a bet there uh, to see one of their specialty bets that they have laid out for you. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use code ALLNBA. New customers bet $5 and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. They bumped that up for you if you noticed. Bet 5 bucks, win 200 instantly in bonus bets. That's code ALLNBA only at DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, back here on the All-NBA Show. Looks like Legs might have had froze on us for a little bit. He'll be back here shortly. The other game that is happening tonight, a do-or-die matchup between the Warriors and the Kings. This is a battle between two teams that know each other extremely well. They're in the same division. They matched up in the playoffs last year. They faced each other as some similar iteration of the teams that they are for most of the half decade, most of the 2020s. So to me, this is one of those series where it's not one where there feels like there's a lot of variability into how the game is going to unfold. I think we know how the game is, the texture the game is going to play, uh, take on, um, the styles the teams are going to try to play and the battles, the battlegrounds for each team. But that doesn't mean I, I think it's going to be razor thin because I think the two teams are razor thin. I've picked the Warriors here. I like mostly how the Warriors have played over the last month of the season. I actually think it's underrated how impactful Draymond Green has been this season. Now, I know that sounds funny because in the first half of the season, his impact was largely negative, And it's the reason if we look at the standings, if you look at the Warriors, it's not hard to imagine a world. They are currently have 36 losses. The Phoenix Suns, who are the sixth seed, have 33 losses. That's three-game difference. It's not hard to envision a world where Draymond does not get suspended the, and all of the antics that happened to him in the first, uh, the first portion of the season and that he is it, that the Warriors avoided the play-in altogether. I think from a talent standpoint, they were a good enough team to not be in the play-in. If you look at the Kings... That was true of them prior to the injuries, but with the injuries, they've obviously been worse than a 46 and 36 team. So I just start from the starting point of this is a team that, or this is a team in the Warriors that I think is much better than the record. And it's a team in the Sacramento Kings, a shorthanded version of them that is much worse than expected. So uh, that is that is sort of my quick take analysis on these two teams is that I think the the Warriors are actually a lot better. And on DraftKings, they are the betting favorite in this one. I think they're one and a half point favorite. I just had it pulled up. They're two and a half point favorites. I think it opened at one and a half and moved to two and a half. Uh, uh, moved to two and a half. I'm told Legs is having a Wi-Fi problem and cannot connect. So hopefully he figures this out in his hotel room and, and joins us. We might have to cut the show a little bit short if he's unable to join to rejoin. But we'll 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 write it out here for a second and see what happens. Um, if we go to specifics in this game about what needs to happen, it is a classic. You have a strong center in Sabonis, and you have a guy in Draymond Green who likes to just get physical. I will say the first variable in this game is just how much contact is allowed. What is the game officiated like? You always know that in the playoffs. Games are allowed a little bit more contact. I think that favors the Warriors if that is to be the case. And I also think that the uh, that the uh, the familiarity of these two teams, you know, Draymond has allowed that contact and he seems to know exactly how. I mean, he's had success against Sabonis in the past. He seems to know how to bother him most. And so I think those things tilt in the favor. In previous iterations of the Kings, when they had Malik Monk, you have 
multiple uh, first of all second pick and roll player so if you're going to try to draw draymond out of the paint even though he's great as a perimeter player it allows some backside rotations that maybe allows the bonus to get going when you take out a malik monk that puts an extra emphasis on De'Aaron fox this is a game where i think fox is going to have to play like 40 minutes uh you know at, at least 40 minutes to to get them through so i think that is another one of the x factors and then of course we all know the ultimate x factor in this game is steph curry he 50 points in the game seven last year against these two teams. This effectively becomes a game seven. And I just expect him to be the clear best player on the court. That's my expectation tonight. So I would roll with the Warriors. I think that it favors them pretty heavily. Um, that being said, I will say I'm so big on narratives for teams, meaning like what does the team tell themselves? What is the story they tell themselves? And I was actually very enamored with the Sacramento Kings and Davion Mitchell in particular in the post game of their 82nd game of the season as they head into it. And somebody was asked about the baggage. Cause if you ask somebody like me, the Kings playing the Warriors, there's baggage to that matchup. Like they beat them last year. They've kind of owned them in the past. Um, that's not a team you want to have to face. And Davion Mitchell said, no, as a team, We've talked about it. We're all excited for an opportunity to redeem last year. We lost in game seven. This is an opportunity to get back. I love that narrative from them. I actually think it's a great um, angle to take. If you're a team that's trying to, uh, you know, rally yourself, if you're trying to like hype yourself up, that's the exact story you have to tell yourself. And again, uh, I think it's important to be able to have a story like that. Let's move on quickly. I might just quickly run through what we were going to talk about. And maybe if Legs is able to join, maybe we'll have to push some of this Mavs Clippers stuff to tomorrow and Cavs Magic. But I want to get quickly into the Mavs and Clippers matchups now. So I'm taking the Warriors tonight. Uh, Lakers, Warriors. Look at me. Big market, Adam. Picking the big market teams. I hope, though, by the way, my rooting interest, if I were to root, I would love to see the Pelicans advance. Not only because they would face the Nuggets. I think that is a better matchup for Denver, although it's a tough one. A lot of respect to the Pelicans. But I think that's a good matchup for Denver. And then the Kings, I like the redemption story. I, I love the angle they're taking there. If we get into the Mavs clip first, here's the thing. This is one of the best, might be the best, matchups in the playoffs, in the 4-5. One of the best matchups in this entire playoffs that has history. I think we'll get some of that as we go deeper. And if you get a Heat Celtics matchup, that one has, you know, recent history as well. That would be a great matchup. But if we look at just this one, they played in 2021. They played multiple times, even before 2021, but they have played each other in the Luka era. And there's a clear rivalry. There's personal matchups to be had. Luka and, and Kawhi. Kawhi would have to guard him in, at certain stretches. That's a a rare example. It might be our best superstar one-on-one -on -one matchup, meaning guys guarding each other. It's one of the best ones we have. We actually have a great one in the Cavs Magic we'll talk about here in a second. So this one has a lot of intrigue. And then the other thing about it is the schedule. We talk about how unbalanced the schedule can be. These teams haven't played each other since December 20th. And I had to go back and to in pre preparation for the show. I had to go back and watch these and, 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 and read about what was going on in these games so I could be jog, jog my memory. They played two times in November. And the first time, Luka had 44 points. He had a 189 offensive rating in that game. Shot six of nine from three, 17 of 21 from the field. This was one of the first games of the year. I think it was November 10th. He was unbelievable. And it was one of his best games of the entire season. If you just talk about he had games with bigger volume. Of course, he had the 73-point game. He had some monster triple-doubles. This game might have been his best one when you factor in the volume was pretty good. I mean, 44 points is an awful lot. But also the efficiency, 6 of 9 from 3, 17 of 21 from the field. That's incredible efficiency. It was also right when Harden arrived. You remember he got traded in like the third week of the season? That's when this game was. He got traded and they lost like 5 out of 6 immediately. This was in that portion. So they, I think we especially throw that out because the Clippers were disheveled at that time. Luka was in his bag. And then the, the next two games, the Clippers dominated. And that came in the reverse where the Mavs were struggling and the Clippers were rolling. What's so fascinating about these teams, the Mavs got off to a great start. They were pretty terrible in the middle of the season when it was clear, okay, they probably need to make some kind of move. And then they've been phenomenal since the trade. So they're a, a, a team of three seasons, basically, within one. Meanwhile, the Clippers are the same thing, almost an exact opposite. They were terrible. Or I'm sorry, they were good. They make the trade and they were terrible. 
and then they were uh or they make the trade and then they become good they get on a heater and then they have been terrible or, or pretty bad mostly bad in the back half in this post all-star break period so you have an inverse of each other i think you have to throw out all of the games from previously in the year i don't think they matter and let's just look at these matchups the this is an offensive battle more than it is a defensive battle, although we'll get to the defense here in a second. The Clippers come in as the fourth best offensive rating in the league, and Dallas is the eighth. Uh, defensively, the Clippers are 16th, and Dallas is 18th. But Dallas has really figured out their defense, and more than figured it out. The trade has made an important impact. I know early in the year, Mavs fans were upset with Legler when he said something to the effect of, uh, you know, he, he criticized Luka Doncic's defense. And I remember a bunch of Mavs fans were saying, old narrative, you got to update your narrative. Here's what Legs really meant. And I know because I talked to Legs, not just on the show, but we talked, you know, uh, off the show. Luka is capable of good defense. What he was talking about was, was it a commitment to defense? And were there times when he would allow, and in key moments, by the way, and this was happening in December even, where he would allow other frustrations to overtake his defense. So maybe he'd talk to an official. Maybe he'd be frustrated about something and not sprint back on defense. You know, not leading the charge there. But defensively, when he's locked in, he has been really good. A really strong defender. I think that, and honestly, we've seen this in the past, his defense and his focus will be at highs in the playoffs. In fact, I'll go ahead and say I think his defense will be at all-time highs in this playoffs. Not just okay, every year he's in the playoffs, he locks in a little bit more. I actually think he is more poised and capable of playing defense, especially one-on-one -on -one defense than ever before. And guess what? The Clippers are going to be there to test him on that. I don't think they're going to be ISOing him and trying to bring him out, although it would be smart to do, try to wear him down, try to make him guard some pick and rolls or, or make him at least try to guard in space to see if you can work him. Um, but I think that is... But I think he is more capable than ever in doing that. And Dallas, to me, the big shift they've made, well, obviously the big shift was personnel. P.J. Washington, uh, you know, getting lively, healthy. Um, Daniel Gafford's been an absolute monster defensively. That's been the biggest thing. But the second biggest thing to me has been they look like a team that has prided themselves on defense. And that's different. From going from, okay, we're a great offensive team and we have to focus on defense, guys. We have to do this. To, no, we're going to hang our hat on our ability to get stops. Um, that is, to me, why they are a different team in the back half of the season. To me, the X factor is Russell Westbrook in the series. And I know that sounds wild. Westbrook has become a bench player. And in a lot of their matchups, he has become sort of a bit player, like run the bench and do this and do that. I actually think Westbrook gets elevated to an important role here, in large part because I think he is probably going to have to match up against Kyrie in some capacity in this one, put pressure on him on the other end and to try to guard him and get physical with him. Um, I don't know that it's going to work, but when you look around at the landscape of players that the Clippers are going to have to deploy, I mean, forget Luca. You're going to throw the, you're going to throw everybody at Luca. You're going to get Paul George on him. You're going to get Kawhi Leonard on him, which I think it's going to come down to. Like if you told me it's a tie game with three minutes to go, Who's guarding who? I think Kawhi is going to be guarding Luka Doncic. And by the way, I think Kawhi is the best bet there. I think Luka will still smoke him. I just think Luka is that unstoppable of a player, both physically and just his way to manipulate the game. And Luka's an, uh, and Kawhi is an incredible defender. One, we don't know about the health stuff, so we'll see how good of a defender he can be, how much energy he has to give on, on, on two ways. But at this moment, I'm going to go ahead and pencil him and say I think he's the best option and I think Luka will beat it. But you go down to the secondary options, and Westbrook is a guy that has been hard for the Clippers to have out there in their like closing groups. Like, are we going to be able to play him? You know, uh, if we're trying to give all of our other guys, now he's going to be off ball. What's it do? Your spacing? You have those questions. But I think defensively, he's going to have to get physical and get into uh, Kyrie Irving, and so I think he becomes an X factor in that series. Legs is apparently still struggling with with Wi-Fi. He's going down. Doesn't think he'll have enough time. So we'll just kind of go quickly through here because we're going to have to circle back and do these and hit this segment again later on. But I want to go to Cavs Magic real quick. We're going to, by the way, Legs will, we are doing a, where we give our prediction show. I think that'll drop Friday. So we'll, we will have one where he actually gives his betting predictions here, but we'll have to circle back to the analysis part, maybe on tomorrow's show to look, go a little bit more in depth on, on the Mavs. And then the Cavs and the Magic. So here's the first storyline here. The Cavs tanked to get this matchup. I Look, it's the modern NBA. This isn't the 80s, but I still think that sends some kind of message, whether deliberate or not, and I think in this case not. I think the Cavs just looked at the Magic and thought that's the best matchup. It probably was. They were smart to do so. 
But if you're the Orlando Magic, it does give you an automatic giant bulletin board material of this is a team that purposefully lost a game. The most shameful take job of the entire season where they go with the lead into the fourth quarter and then play their end of bench guys per obviously trying to lose so they can get this matchup. So the Magic have to look at that and say, you know what? We have to remember that and we have to send a uh, message. This series in the season was 2-2. Uh, they played in December twice, January, and then again in February. They each won one close game. They each won one blowout. So it, to me, I think you look at that and say, okay, these two teams throughout the regular season have been pretty evenly matched up. But I know the Cavs, and I don't actually know on the Magic side, but I know on the Cavs side, they were missing a key starter in every single game, whether it was Donovan Mitchell in one, Mobley in one, Garland in one, and Allen, I believe, in the other. So you haven't actually seen this team at full strength versus each other. Nonetheless, there's something, you know, there's something here. Defensive juggernauts. You're talking about this... Uh, 16th best offense in Cleveland and the 22nd best offense in Orlando, two teams that struggle offensively. And then defensively, Orlando is third best defense, Cleveland seventh best defense. And I actually think both of those teams are could be slightly better than that when they're at full strength. They have some real monsters uh, defensively on both sides between Jared, uh, Jared Allen, Mobley. Uh, you obviously talk on the other side. You've got uh, uh, Jonathan Isaac, who I'm going to talk about, Jalen Suggs. Even Franz Wagner has been very good defensively. That team, both teams, Gary Harris, they have guys that can guard at all positions. The Magic need to score in the paint to win because they're a team that can score under 100 points often, and when they do, they're not very good. They have to get to 100 points, and they're not going to get to that from hot shooting. They might surprise us in one game, although even that, of all the teams in the NBA, the Magic almost feel the least likely if you told me somebody had a uh, – um, an odd 23 game and a playoff game. Like I would, I would list probably all 20 teams before I got to the Orlando magic. They seem the least likely to catch fire from three at volume. So they need to score in the paint, but of course, Cleveland is very good at protecting the paint. So this is why the key matchup to me, and there's actually two of them. And I love both of them. We get a matchup of two of the young best front court players in the NBA in Bancaro and Mobley going head to head offense versus defense. I love that. It's rare that you get these head-to-head. -head. We just talked about it with Kawhi and Luka Doncic, but even that feels a little bit like, you know, is that a perfect matchup? They almost feel Kawhi's almost playing slightly out of position to guard Luka in that one, although it's a great matchup. Bancaro versus Mobley, nope, that's two bigs going at each other, trying to score in each other's block. Mobley trying to own the paint, Bancaro trying to get to the rim. That's a mano y mano fun, young matchup. And then you go to the other side and you say, okay, Jalen Suggs and, and Donovan Mitchell. Mitchell is obviously the key to the Cleveland success. And I think Jalen Suggs is among the best perimeter one-on-one -on, -one on ball defenders in the entire NBA. So I think that this is two great matchups uh, and both teams is offensive. They're weak offensively and where they score offensively is countered by another team's defensive strength, which is what I think makes this for, uh, makes for a very interesting matchup. But my X factor here is Jonathan Isaac. He's the most fascinating like X factor in the entire playoffs for either team. He played 26 minutes in each of his last two games of the season, of the regular season, which was the first time he had played 26 minutes all year. That makes me think that maybe he they the Magic rightfully are looking at him and saying we're a completely different we're the best defense. When I said they were third defensively but could actually be better, 100% of that has to do with Jonathan Isaac and how he changes their team. He might be, I know this sounds incendiary, he might be the single best perimeter defender in the NBA given his length, mobility, and discipline and all of those things. He's so long. He's almost like Wembenyama and just like how long he is, but he's a little bit more maybe perimeter-oriented defensively. Um, but he's an unbelievable defensive player. And the fact that you're worried about his minutes, you know, 18 minutes basically is what he plays. If you can get him up to 26, 27, 28, maybe even 30 minutes in a pinch. I look at that and I say, they're going to be the best defense in the series, in a series that features two of the best defenses in the NBA. So he's my huge X factor. But at the end of the day, if I have to pick, I think I would go Cleveland on this one only because Cleveland, Cleveland has the ability to score in slightly more ways. It doesn't mean they will. But if you just told me that this game was going to, I think this is the series most likely to have both teams finish under 100 in multiple games. I actually think it's possible that we get multiple wins in this series with under 100 points. 
the winning team has under 100 points. But if you told me you had to get to 105, 110 to win, I have more faith that Cleveland is going to have guys make shots and more X-factor players that just go like two for two and a quarter from three, and they're the ones that win it. So that's where I fall on this one. What a bummer. Um, what a bummer, though, with legs falling out of it. Hopefully uh, that gave you a little bit of stuff to think about. Legs should be back tomorrow. I think we're going to be doing a show tomorrow at an uh, even more odd time than usual. As we get towards the playoffs, Legs obviously has the busy schedule with ESPN. They've got them on a bunch of shows today. Uh, but tomorrow we should find a pocket, and then we will be back Thursday and Friday as well, continuing to preview different series every day of the week. And I'll make sure, because I know our Mavs fans love uh, to hear Legs' uh, analysis of the Mavs. We'll make sure we circle back to the Mavs at some point later this week. Well, Adam, right. do you, do you want to wait? He's he said that uh, they're doing a system reboot for the next two minutes, <laughs> and he might be able to come back. It's your call. Uh, let's push it. Let's push it. I know he had a, a hard stop anyway today. So I know that we're probably talking about five minutes of getting him back, but let's push it to tomorrow and we'll try to blame the hotel Wi-Fi. Everybody we will blame the hotel Wi-Fi. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Stay tuned. We have more bonus content coming to the channel the rest of the week. So not only our live show, we'll have some bonus stuff as well. Hit that like button for us. We'll see you tomorrow. Like the mayor.